ಶಾಂತಿರಂತರಿಕ್ಷಗಂಶಾಂತೇರ್ದಿಶಾಂತಿರವಾಂತರ ದಿಶಾಶಾಂತಿರಗ್ನಿಶಾಂತೇರ್ ವಾಯುಶಾಂತಿರಾದಿತ್ಯಶಾಂತೇಶ್ ಚಂದ್ರಮಾಶಾಂತೇರ್ ನಕ್ಷತ್ರ ಶಾಂತಿರಾಪ ಶಾಂತಿರೋಷದಯ ಶಾಂತೇರ್ ವನಸ್ಪತಯ ಶಾಂತೇರ್ ಕೌಶಾಂತಿರಾಂತಿರಶ್ವಶಾಂತಿ ಪುರುಷಾಂತೇರ್ ಬ್ರಹ್ಮಶಾಂತಿರ್ ಬ್ರಾಹ್ಮಣಶಾಂತಿ ಶಾಂತಿರೇವ ಶಾಂತಿ ಶಾಂತಿರ್ ಮೇ ಅಸ್ತು ಶಾಂತಿ ಮೇ ದೇ ಬಿ ಪೀಸ್ ಆನ್ ಅರ್ತ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಸ್ಕಾಯ್ ಮೇ ದೇ ಬಿ ಪೀಸ್ ಇನ್ ದ ವಾಟರ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಇನ್ ಆಲ್ ಡಿರೆಕ್ಷನ್ಸ್ ಮೇ ದೇ ಬಿ ಪೀಸ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಪ್ಲಾಂಟ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಟ್ರೀಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಇನ್ ಆ್ಯನಿಮಲ್ಸ್ ಮೇ ದೇ ಬಿ ಪೀಸ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಹಾರ್ಟ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಆಲ್ ಬೀಯಿಂಗ್ಸ್ ಮೇ ದೇ ಬಿ ಪೀಸ್ ಇನ್ ಎವ್ರಿ ಒನ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಇನ್ ಎವ್ರಿಥಿಂಗ್ ಸರ್ವೇತ್ರ ಸುಖಿನ ಸಂತು ಸರ್ವೇ ಸಂತು ನಿರಾಮಯ ಸರ್ವೇ ಭದ್ರಿ ಪಶ್ಯಂತು ಮಾ ಕಶ್ಚಿತ್ ದುಃಖ ಭಾಗ್ ಭೇತ್ ಸರ್ವಸ್ತರತು ದುರ್ಗಾಣಿ ಸರ್ವೋ ಭದ್ರಿ ಪಶ್ಯತು ಸರ್ವಸದ್ಬುಧಿಮಾಪ್ನೋತು ಸರ್ವಸರ್ವತ್ರ ನಂದತು ಮೇ ಆಲ್ ಬಿ ಹ್ಯಾಪಿ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಹೆಲ್ತಿ ಮೇ ಆಲ್ ಸಿ ವಾಟ್ ಈಸ್ ಗುಡ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಮೇ ನೋ ವನ್ ಎಕ್ಸ್ಪೀರಿಯನ್ಸ್ ಮೆಜರಿ ಮೇ ಆಲ್ ಓವರ್ಕಮ್ ದೇರ್ ಆಬ್ಸ್ಟಿಕಲ್ಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಅಕ್ವಾಯರ್ ಗುಡ್ ಟೆಂಡೆನ್ಸೀಸ್ ಮೇ ಪೀಪಲ್ ಎವ್ರಿವೇರ್ ಫೈನ್ ಜಾಯ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಫುಲ್ಫಿಲ್ಮೆಂಟ್ let us now spend some time touching the center of peace and joy in our hearts a good way to begin the practice is to withdraw the scattered energies of the mind and bring them to rest on one point that point can be our own breathing let us therefore practice breathing with awareness as we breathe in let us visualize that our body and mind are being filled with love strength and compassion and as we breathe out let us release all the stress anxiety and exhaustion in the body and mind let us practice this way for a while let us now turn our attention to the region of our heart although god is present everywhere and in every one the divine presence can be felt most clearly in our own hearts we can meditate in any way we have been taught to remain focused we can take the help 
of a short mental prayer or a mantra or a divine name. Let us now spend some time dwelling on the presence of God in our hearts. Satoma Satkamaya Tamasoma Jyotirgamaya Mrityorma Amritam Gamaya Aviravir Mayeti Rudrayate Dakshinam Mukham Tenamam Pahinityam May the Divine lead us from the unreal to the real from darkness to light, from death to immortality. May the divine consciousness fill our hearts and protect us. Resume our study with verse number 9 on page 130. Na sandrushe tishthati rupa masya na chakshusha pashyati kascha nainam rida manisha manasa bhiklipto ya etat vidur amrutaste bhavanti. His form is not within the field of vision. None can see him with the eyes. He is revealed by the intuition of the intellect which resides in the heart and controls the mind. Those who know him become immortal. So the nature of the, the Atman or Brahman, the supreme reality is described here. Although the translation puts it in the masculine, uh, him, there is really no reference to gender in the text itself. And so the highest reality seen in Vedanta is beyond gender. It's neither male nor female. The only difficulty in translation is um, how, how do you refer to a reality which is neither male nor female? Well, one option is to refer to it as it. The problem with it is, we refer it to all these lifeless material objects. And so that doesn't sound great either. So it's really the limitation of language um, which forces us to use w one of the three options available. And therefore, while he is not the most accurate way to do it, um, uh, there is really nothing else we could do. We just, we just have to recognize the limitation of language there. 
न संतृषे तिष्ठति रूपम रूपम इज फॉर्म सो इट्स फॉर्म कैनॉट कैनॉट बी सीन नाउ ऑल दो द वर्ड सीन इज सीन इज इज रियली डीलिंग विथ आईज दैट्स ओनली एन एग्जाम्पल इन द सेंस दैट वॉट दिस लाइन पॉइंट्स आउट इज दैट दैट हाइएस्ट रियालिटी cannot be comprehended cannot be grasped by any of our senses that's what the next verse says none can see him with the eyes so not if because the highest reality is not simply an object of perception in the sense that it doesn't have a form it doesn't have any color and our eyes can only see something that needs to have a form some kind of a color but it not even a form of sound either so we cannot hear it we cannot taste it we cannot none of our senses can grasp it then but that's all that we have <clears throat> so ev- everything that we see and understand in life comes through the senses and so senses are incapable of grasping that reality then how do we find that reality in fact in some of the other passages in the upanishad it says even the mind cannot reach that the intellect cannot reach that so nothing can reach there and therefore the next verse points out rida manisha manasa abhikluptaha so it's translated here as revealed by the intuition of the intellect which resides in the heart and controls the mind once well, found is very convoluted in many ways the translation in in sanskrit what it simply means is so there is this higher power of intuition within our heart uh all that that the word buddhi gets often translated as the intellect uh depending on the context the buddhi can also refer to that refined power of the intellect and sometimes the word that gets used for that refined part of the intellect as medha or even dhi the in the gayatri prayer the second part of the prayer which says please awakening of the dhi awakening of that spiritual intuition so it is that intuition which really controls the mind which really makes sure that the mind is on the right track we will see that the mind is often described in books as that faculty of our inner instrument which always weighs the pros and cons it doesn't take a decision the decision is taken once the inner instrument begins to decide or choose between the different options we call it buddhi but when it is simply looking at all the pros and cons and that is called the mind that function is called the mind sanskrit they say sankalpa vikalpatmakam manaha sankalpa and vikalpa the pros and cons of everything is really seen by that function which we in sanskrit they say manas translated as mind the confusion come because sometimes all of the fa- functions collectively we call it as mind so we know that in life lot of times we have different options should i do this should i do that and then there is something within us which then says choose this now a lot of times the choices that we make in life are often colored by our desires by our ambitions our hopes a lot of these factors influence the choices that we make in life now what would happen if i am able to free my mind of all material ambitions all desires just make the mind crystal clear then the decision that that higher faculty will make when it is not colored by any of these things that decision that choice will be ideal that choice won't go wrong so dhi is really that part of the mind which has been freed from all <clears throat> limiting forces so the desires ambitions hopes fears that we all have constrict the ability of the mind to do its function fully so the moment we become free from this then the full potential of the mind 
which is what dhi is. So there are these two passages in the Upanishad. In one place it says that that highest truth cannot be reached by the senses, cannot be reached by the mind. It comes here, it comes in many other places also. And then there is another place in the Upanishad which says that that, that highest reality can be known only by the mind. Now it's clearly, on the face of it, very superficially, it's very contradictory. One place you say the mind cannot reach there, and the second place you say only through the mind you can reach there. And therefore we go to the commentaries. And Shankaracharya in his commentary points out, Su Samskrutena Manasa. In other words, the mind that is purified is able to show us the path to that reality. But the mind that is, now what does purity mean? And simply means what I mentioned earlier. The mind that has been freed from all <coughs> desires and ambitions and fears and hopes related to the perishable things of this world. So when the mind is free from this, then the mind is technically called pure. And it's through that pure mind which resides in the heart, it is through that 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 highest reality is revealed. And so, one of the primary and preliminary spiritual practices is really purifying our mind, bringing that inner clarity. Every spiritual seeker wants to experience the highest, experience the divine. Every devotee wants to have the vision of God. And that's a perfect goal or ideal we must strive for. <coughs> But I won't be able to see the reality as it is if the lenses of my <coughs> of perception, they are colored or they are distorted. So first thing I need to do is clear the lenses. So self-purification is always the first step before we have a true spiritual experience. In fact, all of the four yogas that we study are primarily means of purifying oneself. So Jnana Yoga, the path of knowledge, is really purification of the power of reason. Bhakti Yoga, the path of devotion, is primarily purifying our emotions. We all have emotions, we have feeling, but those emotions are, are colored, are kind of contaminated because many of these emotions or feelings are directed towards the perishable things, not towards the imperishable, which is the reality. So purifying the emotions means making sure that these emotions, which are a very powerful force within us, but that these emotions go in the right direction. Similarly, with the power of reason, we know that um, in the court of law, both the prosecution and the defense both are juggling the same set of evidence. The evidence is the same. Um, it just depends on how you interpret it. So similarly, the reason, that is why they often say, what can be proved by reason can also be disproved by reason. And it just depends on how you apply reason. Therefore, the Upanishad will say that the highest reality cannot be attained merely through reasoning or argumentation. But reasoning is helpful. We can take reason as far as it can take us. But even in order to manifest the full potential of our faculty that uses logic or reasoning, that needs to be purified. So that we are saints quoting scriptures, not devils quoting scriptures. Because both can, scriptures are there. Anybody can quote it to their advantage. And therefore, Jnana Yoga, the path of knowledge, purifies reason. The path of love purifies emotion. And both Karma Yoga and Raja Yoga, they purify and strengthen the, the will power, power of the will. K practice of Karma Yoga helps us to purify will power as it manifests through the work that we do in the external world. And Raja Yoga helps to purify the will power as it manifests in our internal world controlling and purifying the powers of the mind. So it is that higher faculty within us, it is through that faculty that that highest reality can be revealed. 
those who know him become immortal. Now this is the r real immortality. Because you, we have seen um, in this Upanishad itself, earlier it says, well, if you go to heaven, you become immortal. Sometimes the citizens of heaven, the celestial citizens, are sometimes referred to as Amar. Amar literally means immortal. Now that's um, a relative immortality. If it, I don't know how that word sounds, that phrase sounds. In other words, um, I mean, let's think about it this way. If we think about a human life, give and take a few years, around 100, maximum. Um, but if you now look at the mountain, and someone asks you, how long has this mountain been around? And then you'll say, oh, it's always been there. People come and go, uh, but the mountain is always there. Now, it makes sense. No one will say you're telling a lie. But if you want to be very technical about it, well, the, the mountain has been there always. That also had a beginning, maybe a few thousand years or a few million years. But relatively, we say the mountain is always there, but we come and go. In the same way, because the human span of life is around 100, the people who live in heaven, maybe, I don't know how long they live, but maybe a million years. That might sound like a lot. Still, that's still a finite number. That's still not, you're not really immortal, but you're not going to die for a long time. It's only in that sense. But this immortality here becomes immortal. This is the real immortality. Why is this a real immortality? If Immortality in the strictest sense of the term means a person will never die. That is possible only if the person is never born. Because birth and death go together. Beginning and end go together. If I have begun in time, I'll end in time. If I was born at some point, I'm going to die. And this person becomes immortal simply by knowing that I was never really born. That what was born is this body. As long as I feel identified with this body, as long as I feel this is me, the fear of death, the anxiety about death, the thought about death will never go. Because I am this and this was born, so this is going to die. But once I know I am not this, which means I was never born, because the only thing that is born is this body. And therefore, there is no death for me. How do I know that this is what I'll experience? Because we are already experiencing it every day. Not for 24 hours, but maybe for a few minutes at least. That part of the day when we are fast asleep, when we are not even dreaming, which is often described as sushupti, the deep sleep. In that state of deep sleep, no one so far has reported that they were anxious about their death, or they were worried about what's going to happen the next day, or they had this body ache or this mental stress or anxiety. In that state of deep sleep, there is no anxiety, there is no stress, there are no problems, there is no death, there is no worry, there is nothing. And that is because in the state of deep sleep, I don't have the awareness that I am this. I don't have the awareness I am the mind. So a simple observation, just our own personal observation, that those times when I do not feel identified with the body and mind, everything connected with the body and mind is no longer my problem. As soon as I wake up and I feel, oh, now I've woken up. This is who I am. Then immediately say, oh, I must do this. I must go and check my email. All of these things come because suddenly I become identified with this. And so that is the idea. So if I know I'm never born, we will never die. There was a great disciple of Ramakrishna. My name is Swami Shivananda. He was often called in the tradition Mahapurush Maharaj. And there is a story about once someone went and asked him, uh, Swamiji, 
uh, they wanted to celebrate his birthday and said, Swamiji, when were you born? And he just looked and smiled and said, Fool, no, when is your birthday? And then he, he smiled and said, I was never born. <laughs> now that might seem odd, like if you're never born, who are you? Well, they should have asked that and we would have seen what he would have said. And I think that's a good, good test. I mean, if someone were to ask you, who are you? And well, most probably we will prefer by just telling what our name is or where we are. There are any number of ways we can answer the question, who are you? And you can feel free to answer that question in whichever way is appropriate for that occasion and in that context. But occasionally, when you are just by yourself, we can ask ourselves, who am I? And then see what, what answer comes. What answer we get to the question, who am I, is probably a good indication of where we are on the spiritual path. And it's possible that our answer may not be very simple. It's possible that our answers may come with some caveats. It's possible that we might say something like, intellectually, I'm convinced that I'm spirit, I'm the Atman. But that's not something I remember always. So I go about my day-to-day -day activities, most of the think time thinking I'm a human being. But when I read the Upanishad, when I am praying or meditating, I get some sense of the idea that maybe in reality I may be divine, but, but that divinity doesn't seem to stick. My humanity is too clinging onto me. And that could be a kind of a long way of answering it. And that's probably true with many of the spiritual seekers. And if that is the case, then spiritual life becomes very easy. All that I need to do is try to remember that I am divine, I am pure and perfect. And the more I remember that, the more I affirm my divine spirit, my divine nature, the less of a human being I'll become. In other words, I cannot be human and divine at the same time. That's the thing. Um, just like the classical example given in Vedanta is, you mistake a rope for a snake. You never see both at the same time. If you are mistaking a rope for a snake, if you see the snake, you don't see the rope. If you see the rope, you don't see the snake. You do not see both at the same time. What most of us would like, the idea of just being divine is wonderful. And that's not so much a problem. Letting go of our human identity, that's the problem. So if someone said, well, I would like to be divine, but also remain human, um, that's really the tension. That's really the dilemma. That's really the, the stress spiritual seekers experience. An intellectual conviction or a spiritual aspiration towards divinity, while the daily experience of being held down by our humanity. And with all of our spiritual practices are really meant to, to separate us from our fake. The word fake adjective is being bandied about too, around too much these days. Oftentimes we connect with news, but, but it's identity really. See, if I can let go of my fake identity, then I will recover the, the real identity, the true identity. I cannot have both at the same time. And when will that happen? That's described in the next verse. Yada panchavatishthante jnana nimanasa saha buddhishchana vicheshtati tama huf paramam gatim When the five senses of perception lie still with the mind in the self, when even the intellect works not, that is the supreme state, they say. So all the five senses, the earlier the Upanishad pointed out that Our senses are kind of defective. Defective from a spiritual standpoint, because most spiritual texts say the truth is within, and they want us to look within. 
Unfortunately, all of our senses are programmed to just go outside. So the, the sooner I open my eyes, I'm, everything that is outside is revealed to me. Um, same thing with sound. Which everything with regard to the external world, the senses are, when they are in the working condition, they are great in just going and grasping all the sound waves and the light and the, and the taste buds. Everything are just perfect. But the truth is not outside. The truth is inside. When I open my eyes and look, I don't need to make any effort to see. I just need to open my eyes and immediately I see. But then we are told at the time of meditation, look in your heart. Now that is difficult because you close your eyes and then everything is shut out, you just see darkness. So how can I then turn the direction of my senses? Instead of my eyes going out, how can I teach them to take a, make a U-turn and look inside? And that is what the whole Vedantic practice is. And that is what is meant here by saying, when the five senses of perception lie still, so the moment I find a way of training my senses to not just go and keep on grasping things, then they remain still with the mind. And the mind then, free from not only the data that the senses bring to the mind, but one other great hurdle in the path of the mind is this division of time into past, present, and future. Because that's where the mind gets caught up. Because we tend to divide time, divide our experience with past, present and future, most of the time what the mind is engaged in is either remembering things of the past, memories that come, uh, but what happened early this morning or yesterday or last week or last year, or worried about tomorrow, the deadlines I have to meet, um, or about what the stock market will be. Or, or what the election, next election, what kind of results it will produce. So if what things that are going to happen in the future or the things that have happened in the past? In fact, we might be surprised that most people are busy more with either dwelling in the past or worrying about the future. Which is why we don't really live we are merely existing. That's true. We exist. But are we living? Because living is possible only in the present. But if I'm all the time thinking about the past or the future, I'm not really living. And so we need to find a way. The mind, the mindset mind is still means the mind which is not preoccupied with the past or the future. And on other occasions we have discuss this in greater detail about how to free the mind from the hold of the past and future. So that is what is intended here. When the five senses of perception lie still with the mind, when even the intellect works not. Again, as long as I ascribe reality to whatever is outside of me, the intellect will react to it. And that's, that's essentially the thing. A lot of the, people speak about action. I don't think most of us are not, not engaged in activity per se. Uh, what we are doing most of the time is reacting. Things are happening around us and we are reacting to them. And our reactions are often based on, because there are already existing samskaras, existing impressions, there are things we like, there are things we don't like, there are people we love, there are people we hate, and there are things we love, there are things we hate. So essentially when anything is presented before us, the mind invariably says, that's good, that's bad, I like it, I don't like it, that's terrible, and so on. So we are making all these judgments reflexively throughout the day, and then making decisions based on these. So. 
if I have to really see things, I have to first stop reacting to things. Because again, every time I react, I'm using that, that layer over my mind, which is filled with these biases and prejudices that I already have. So that is what is meant by saying, when even the intellect works not, that is the supreme state. And there will be occasions for those who have been practicing meditation and prayer. Many have experienced that on, it may not happen every day, but there are some times when you are deep in prayer, deep in worship, deep in meditation, there may be flashes of, of, of some moments when you will find everything becomes still. And that's wonderful because that experience of of stillness, it's, it's, it's a, sometimes you might notice um, uh, when it snows and you, you're not really worried about, no, I have to go now and shovel outside and then, then you won't feel it. If you're not worried about any of that and you're just sitting by your window and you just find it's kind of the snow is gradually falling. It's not a storm, it's just, just a regular snow falling. There is, at least externally, as much as you can see it, you just feel like everything has come to a kind of a still. Everything has slowed down. Something much more powerful, much more intense than that can occur in the heart. At some time, when you have a really good meditation or a good prayer, everything slows down. Everything comes to a still. And sometimes that Experience might last won't be a few seconds or a few minutes, but it's extremely rejuvenating. You just feel so strong. You just feel so light. You just feel so joyful after that. And that's the kind of an experience an enlightened being is having every moment all the time. And so, sometimes when we speak about grace, that is how sometimes the grace can come in the life of a spiritual seeker. Those are sometimes referred to in a poem by, by the phrase, the intimations of immortality. So that big experience might come sometime, but we can already get these few glimpses when we practice our daily discipline, our japa meditation with regularity, with faith, with sincerity every day. That is the supreme state, they say. Verse 11. Tam yoga miti manyante, stira mindriya dharanam, apramattas tada bhavati, yogo hi prabhavapyayo. That firm control of the senses is known as yoga. Then the yogin becomes free from all vagaries of mind, for the yoga can be acquired and lost. So that stillness. Nowadays, of course, if you use the word yoga, immediately these different postures come to mind. But this is real yoga, that complete stillness. When the senses are completely merged in the mind, the mind is still, the intellect doesn't move, everything has come to a standstill, as it were. So that state, that experience really, is the experience of real yoga. That firm control of the senses is known as yoga. It is then that the yogi becomes free from all vagaries of the mind. Up, the word you use, apramatta. Pramada in Sanskrit means an error, mistake. And throughout the day, we are always making smaller, big mistakes. Now, I mean, clearly, there are mistakes in, in the workplace and things you do rightly or wrongly. And those mistakes are mistakes. But the mistake that is spoken of here is really the mistake or the error of not seeing what is there and seeing what is not there. In other words, affirming the reality of the body, mind, and this perishable world, seeing it as, as a stable entity, which in fact it is not, and not even being aware of the source of all awareness within our own heart. So that is the mistake we make. That is ascribing reality to that which is only an appearance and 
totally ignoring or not even being aware of the reality which is always present. So that kind of mistake, a yogi becomes completely free from. In other words, the yogi always, because of that clarity, because of that stillness, the yogi sees what is there as it is. But I think a better way to put that is not that the yogi sees it. One who sees it is a yogi. For the yoga can be acquired and lost. And this is important because that ability of st becoming still, that can be lost. Because I, I said in the beginning we might experience it only for a few moments. So we know that it can be acquired because many of us do experience it. But it doesn't stay, doesn't stick for longer than a few seconds or a minute. It also gets lost. Why does it get lost? Because of pramada, because of the vagaries of the mind. So the more the vagaries of the mind become less, the less of pramada, the less of the error will occur. And then that yoga which is acquired will not be lost immediately. So if in the beginning I've been experiencing it only for a few moments, then maybe through practice I might be able to make it last a little bit longer then a little bit longer, a little bit longer. And that's essentially how it is. So, spiritual enlightenment can occur in many different ways. There is no just one blueprint for everybody. It's possible that through God's grace, boom, just become enlightened, the problem solved. Possible. Uh, and most of us would want that to happen to us. Uh, why not? But that's not within our control. We don't even know when or if that will happen. So what do we do until then? We can't say, oh, I, my life can continue as it is, because sooner or later that will happen. If I'm not in a hurry, then, then maybe that's fine. And I can keep on hoping, as we have already been hoping for millions and trillions of lives in the past. But if we feel, you know, I can't wait indefinitely. But that's essentially what a conscious spiritual life means. Taking spiritual life seriously means I'm not prepared to wait indefinitely for my enlightenment. I need to do something about it myself. I can't simply hope, I'm just going to sit here and hope that someday some rescue ship will come and take me. Um, not that I don't believe it will come, but I can say, why don't I start walking first? And um, if the ship is to come, it can take me whenever it wants, but let me start walking, let me start making some progress. And so that's the purpose of the spiritual struggles that we all go through. And as we struggle, every step we take is bringing us closer to that goal by one step. There is a Chinese proverb which says, even the journey of a thousand miles begins with the first step. And that getting closer can occur through the small bits of experiences we might get. And that can be a great encouragement. Because no matter how small that experience might be, it strengthens our faith. It, it, it generates greater enthusiasm. It makes us feel, I'm on the right track. And then uh, we'll be able to continue our spiritual struggle with greater enthusiasm. So that is what is meant by saying yoga can be acquired and lost. So we can acquire it, and our struggle is to not lose it quickly. Our struggle is to hold it. So the ability to hold that experience for a long time, that holding of that experience can come only with a firm ethical and moral foundation. Because if the life is not built on strong ethics, on dharma, we will not be able to hold that experience. And therefore, success in spiritual life is possible only when it is built on a strong moral foundation. So there has to be First of all, as, as um, 
uh, one of the Swamis of our order used to say, even before becoming a spiritual seeker, I must first become a gentleman. Or by gentleman, again, no, no, not in a kind of a very, uh, no gender specific uh, uh, intention. It doesn't mean gentleman in the sense of a man. It means that first I must become a good person. If I'm not an honest, truthful, unselfish person, I can forget about being a spiritual seeker. And so therefore, um, the importance of ethics and morality can never be um, uh, emphasized more. It's, it's always very, very important. All right, so we'll stop here today. Uh, if you have any thoughts, ideas, questions, comments, feel free to ask. Swamiji, you mentioned that um, like so, uh, rope and snake, we cannot see both. So we should start thinking that we are perfect. How could I keep perfecting myself and think that I am perfect? Yes, so the idea is to recognize that all the imperfections within me are really belong, belong to the body and mind. <clears throat> so there is the Atman, there is the mind, there is the body. All the imperfections belong to this perishable body and mind. The Atman is perfect. So to say that I am perfect really means affirming that my true identity is the Atman. That in reality, I am without birth, without death. In reality, I am unchanging. In reality, I am the eternal witness. Now, of course, just thinking like that doesn't mean we are going to experience it all the time. So every time there is a stress or a worry or anxiety, um, I can just, just remind myself, yes, recognize the stress within us, but recognize this is the way this mind now, this is the something that is happening to my mind. Now, even creating that little bit of a, a distance between me and my mind, that doesn't mean that the stress will immediately go away. But because I've created a little space between me and the mind, I will be able to look at my own stress objectively and then deal with it intelligently. And that is why sometimes when we are, when we are, are confused, we go and take the help of someone else, someone whose judgment we trust. And the benefit that the other person has is that person is able to look at my problems objectively. For me to look at my problems objectively, it's difficult because they are my problems. But if I remember I am the Atman, then it's possible for me to objectify my own problems. So I can solve my own problems. That, so that's not a right statement. I, I, they are not my own problem. I can solve the problems of this mind, which I ignorantly think is mine. That's a kind of long way to put it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Srikant? Yeah. Uh, Swamiji, I think the meaning of yoga, I think you have described in the book uh, separately, like joining with God or separating from God. In this, it mentions that controlling the senses is yoga, form control. Yes, I mean, again, yoga is a word that gets defined and described in different ways. And the way the word yoga, when it to take it to the root meaning, has really two, two distinct meanings. One way of understanding yoga means in a sense of concentration. And so when Patanjali says, yoga chitta vritti nirodha, Yoga is stilling the waves in the mind. So he is primarily using that word yoga in the sense of concentration. Because when the mind becomes still, then uh, it's easy to concentrate. Uh, another meaning of the word yoga is joining. And in order to join, you need two things at least. And so in Vedanta, primarily, yoga is, well, the two, two meanings are related, 
but primarily the word yoga is in the, used in the sense of joining. And in the sense, here it means joining the jivatma with the paramatma, this individual self with the supreme self. So these are the two, two ways of understanding it. Again, um, even in, in the philosophy of Sankhya and Yoga, which Patanjali follows, the word yoga is, some, is a little bit of a misnomer if you, if you see it in the sense of joining. Because in, uh, what, what is seen in yoga and Sankhya schools of thought are this true, the entire human experience is reduced to two primal entities. One is the principle of material, materiality called prakriti, and then the principle of consciousness called purusha. And so according to that metaphysic, purusha has been caught up in prakriti. Consciousness, the principle of consciousness is, is he has been trapped by material nature. And the goal, according to yoga, in, as described in Patanjali, is freeing that purusha from prakriti, freeing that conscious principle which has been trapped by prakriti. And so there is actually a verse which says, this yoga is actually a vyoga, is really a separation, it's not so much a joining, it's separating the purusha from prakriti. So this word yoga gets used in many different ways. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> Swamiji, as you mentioned, the stilling of the mind, as mentioned in the Patanjali's um, teaching. Uh, so it, um, when we look at the you know, mind, loosely we say mind, so the poor faculty of the mind, Manas, Chitta, Ahankar, Buddhi, right? As mentioned in the Patanjali. So those all those, those faculty need to be stilled, right? Mm -hmm. And how to still? Because this Upanishad mentioned about uh, resting the senses in Manas, right? And then resting the Buddhi. How about Chitta and Ahankar? How to rest them? No, they are not, they are not four. You don't think of mind as some kind of a four compartments with these four names. The, the inner instrument is just one. And these four names that you see are just the different functionalities of that one instrument. Mm -hmm. So when that inner instrument is just weighing the pros and cons, you call the mind. When you look upon that same instrument as determining a course of action, that's called buddhi, it's called the determinative faculty. When you look at that same instrument as a kind of a receptacle, which holds all the impressions and memories, you call it chitta. And that the same instrument which, which gives you the sense of I, you call it ahankara. So they are not like four different things. So you don't have to think about it separately. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Mahendra. So, so Swamiji, when you uh, think about Gita and chapter 6, when uh, Arjuna says to Krishna that uh, mind is so difficult to control, how should we be interpreting that statement to or question? Because he's a great mind and he's really somebody. Arjuna is not a great mind. No, no but he's. I mean, greater than us, but not, not really <laughs> that great. I mean, he was confused, right? I mean, yeah. If he was a, like super great, then he wouldn't have had any confusion. Yes, okay. and then uh, Krishna says that you can do with practice that yeah. mind can be. But is practice when he says, it's, is it just the yoga, yoga, what you describe in terms of... Well, practice is what, uh, practice primarily means following the instructions of one's teacher. Because in order to practice, we say, what should I practice? Who is going to tell me what to practice? So I need someone, a guide, someone who has been on that path before and who can tell me what to do. So it's a practice of whatever I have been taught by my teacher. Yes. When I first heard, um, I saw a Hatha yoga class um, in my early 20s when I was living in Berkeley, and someone suggested that would be good. I have a bad back for my back. And then I learned from my teacher that Hatha yoga was done to relax your body for meditation. 
And then, you know, as I got older, I learned much more about what you were talking about, mm -hmm. or Hatha Yoga, and is, and I, I don't need to say anything more because it's complex, I think. Um, yes, I'm a, it's, I mean, it's not true. It's not true that Hatha Yoga deals only with the body. That's not really true. Um, Hatha Yoga also is, is a spiritual path. Uh, but, but the preliminary practices of Hatha Yoga are primarily dealing with controlling the body. And most people who turn to yoga are not, who do practice Hatha Yoga, are not necessarily thinking about enlightenment, all of that. It's just more about the, 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 the health benefits of Hatha Yoga. And unfortunately, therefore, Hatha Yoga kind of has gotten identified only with these asanas and etc. But, but Hatha Yoga, if, if followed in the traditional way, is also a way to attain enlightenment. But, uh, but uh, it's rather sad that it has gotten identified only with, uh, with asanas. Yeah. 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 When I heard the term power yoga, I was shocked. Hmm? After 9-11, I went up to the Pocono Mountains to the Himalayan Institute for a while, and somebody came to the yoga, the yoga class in the morning, and she had been going to a power yoga class in Florida, I think, and I was shocked yeah, at yeah. that concept, yeah. because spiritual power is different than... Yeah. But I mean, I there are sometimes people come and ask me whether we have uh, yoga classes here. And I say, yeah, we've got karma yoga classes. <laughs> and now you're going to say, oh, no, no, that doesn't interest them at all. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we will stop here today. And when we meet next week, we will begin with verse number 12. <clears throat> Om Jananim Saradam Devim Ramakrishnam Jagat Gurum Pada Padme Tayo Shritva Pranamami Muhur Muhu On Sunday, we will celebrate Guru Purnima. Uh, the function will begin at 11 o'clock. We'll have a prayer, meditation, a short worship, a reflection on the role of Guru in spiritual life, and then we'll have potluck lunch. So all of you are welcome. Uh, and this is the day we celebrate. Uh, everyone uh, comes and remembers their spiritual teacher, their Guru, uh, and also the spiritual lineage to which we belong. Many of us come from different traditions. We all may not have the same spiritual teacher, but this is one day when we honor and respect not only our own spiritual teacher, but all the great spiritual teachers of the past, present, and future. Uh, this day is often identified with the birthday of Vyasa, who is considered, who, who is considered a very great teacher in the Vedanta tradition. And so it is his birthday is celebrated as Guru Purnima. The actual Guru Purnima, according to the lunar calendar, comes next Tuesday. But we are celebrating it on Sunday. So that will be easier for everyone to attend. So that function will be on Sunday at 11. Next Wednesday, we will continue with the study of the Upanishad. And then on Tuesday and Saturday, our meditation will also continue as usual. Let's conclude with a prayer now. May the Divine Being, who is the Father in Heaven of the Christians, Holy One of the Jewish Faith, Allah of the Muslims, Buddha of the Buddhists, Tao of the Taoists, Aura Mazda of the Zoroastrians, the Great Spirit of the Native Americans, and Brahman of the Hindus, 
Lead us from the unreal to the real, from darkness to light, from death to immortality. May we be granted strength, freedom, and clear understanding. May we learn to see God in our own hearts and in everyone around us. May God bless us all and fill our hearts with gratitude, grace, and love. Om Shanti 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 Peace, peace, peace be unto God.